In celebration of the 19th Amendment, this presentation highlights just a few of the many thousands of people who fought for women's suffrage. Did you know that New York's voting laws originally included mention of he or she and his or her ballot? In 1777, New York struck the female pronouns disenfranchising its women. Massachusetts did the same thing in 1780 and New Hampshire did so in 1784. After the ratification of the U.S. Constitution, which required states to write their own election laws, the voting rights of women were revoked everywhere except for New Jersey, where apparently everything was legal until 1807, when the Garden State got around to ending women's suffrage, too. Did you also know that disenfranchisement can take many forms, such as purging voter rolls, passing voter identification requirements, understaffing or closing polling places, and gerrymandering of voting districts. All of these quotes and information are taken from the book review by Casey Sepp of the Women's Suffrage Movement by Sally Roche Wagner. In her later years, Harriet Tubman worked to promote the cause of women's suffrage. She began attending meetings of suffragist organizations and soon was working alongside Susan B. Anthony and Emily Howland. Harriet Tubman used the sacrifices of countless women through modern history as evidence of women's equality to men. Ida B. Wells Barnett stands as one of our nation's most uncompromising leaders and most ardent defenders of democracy. She was born in Holly Springs, Mississippi in 1862 and died in Chicago in 1931. It was in Memphis where she began her fight for racial and gender justice. In 1884, she was asked by the conductor of the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad to give up her seat on the train to a white man and ordered her into the smoking or Jim Crow car. Despite the 1875 Civil Rights Act, which banned discrimination on the basis of race, creed, or color in theaters, hotels, and transports, several railroad companies defied this congressional mandate. Her defiant act was before Plessy v. Ferguson of 1896, the Supreme Court decision that established the doctrine of separate but equal, which constitutionalized racial segregation. Wells was forcibly removed from the train and she immediately hired an attorney to sue the railroad and won her case in the local circuit courts, but the railroad company appealed to the Supreme Court of Tennessee and it reversed the lower court's ruling. This was the first of many struggles Wells engaged to overturn injustices against women and people of color. She was one of two African-American women to sign the call to form the NAACP. In 1840, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was outraged when the world's anti-slavery convention in London denied official standing to women delegates, including Lucretia Mott. In 1848, she and Mott called for a women's rights convention to be held in Seneca Falls, New York. That convention and the Declaration of Sentiments, written by Stanton and approved there, is credited with initiating the long struggle towards women's rights and women's suffrage. After 1852, Stanton and Anthony worked in partnership and later founded the National Woman Suffrage Association. In 1872, in an attempt to claim that the Constitution already permitted women to vote, Anthony cast a test vote in Rochester, New York in the presidential election. She was found guilty of voting and she refused to pay the resulting fine, and it should be noted that no attempt was made to force her to do so. Stanton was also effective in winning property rights for married women, equal guardianship of children, and liberalized divorce laws so that women could lead abusive marriages. Also shown is the banner of the National Women's Party. The purple, white, and gold were declared the official colors of the party in 1913 and were featured prominently in parades, plays, and campaigns nationwide. It took three roll calls before the youngest member of the Tennessee legislature, Representative Harry Byrne, changed his nay vote to a yay. He was urged in a letter from his mother to, quote, be a good boy and vote for the amendment. Explaining his vote to his colleagues on the House floor the following day, Byrne said, I know that a mother's advice is always safest for her boy to follow, and my mother wanted me to vote for ratification. Shown here are Banks Turner, whose vote prevented the tabling of the suffrage resolution, Catherine Flanagan, Anita Pulitzer, Harry Byrne, Thomas Simpson, who resisted almost inhuman pressure of anti-suffrage interests, Betty Graham, and Sue Shelton White, members of the National Woman's Party.
Harry Byrne's single vote, reinforced by the vote of Banks-Turner, ratified the 19th Amendment in Tennessee, making it a perfect 36. They demonstrated how one vote can change history. In 1910, Alice Paul, a 28-year-old Quaker from New Jersey, returned to the United States after involvement with the militant branch of the British suffrage movement. In the U.S., she was arrested repeatedly, imprisoned, went on a hunger strike, and was forcibly fed. In 1912, she asked the National American Woman's Suffrage Association to allow her to organize a suffrage parade to be held in Washington at the time of Wilson's inauguration, thus ensuring maximum press attention. She promised to raise the necessary funds and she convened the first meeting of her committee on January 2nd, 1913. She started raising funds and the others Paul recruited work nonstop for two months. By March 3rd, the committee organized and found the money for a major suffrage parade with floats, banners, speakers, and a 20-page official program, as seen here. The event cost $14,900, a princely sum in 1913 when the average annual wage was only $620. While many suffragists left public life after passage of the 19th Amendment, Alice Paul believed the true battle for equality had yet to be won. In 1923, she authored the Lucretia Mott Amendment, which called for absolute equality, stating, quote, men and women shall have equal rights throughout the United States and in every place subject to its jurisdiction, unquote. The Equal Rights Amendment, or the ERA, was introduced in every session of Congress from 1923 until it passed in 1972, but it has yet to be ratified. In a 1972 interview, Alice Paul stated, quote, I never doubted that equal rights was the right direction. Most reforms, most problems are complicated. But to me, there is nothing complicated about ordinary equality. Here we have the text from the Equal Rights Amendment. And it should be noted that 96% of all Americans believe that women already have equal rights. However, they really don't. It's long past time that the Constitution acknowledge women as equal citizens deserving of full human rights and civil rights. I can imagine these heroines saying to us, after our many years of fighting to achieve voting rights for women, nothing is more important to us than for you to vote in every election. Read more about the 19th Amendment on the constitutiondaycenter.org website.